Well, good morning, 3D. I trust you're already having a great worship experience there. We certainly are here with our team in South Africa. We're actually with one of the campuses of Doxadale called Midstream in a worship experience here while you're worshiping there. And I'll be speaking here in just a few minutes, but you're thinking, well, then who's going to speak for us? Well, that's why I wanted to speak to you just for a moment to introduce today a special guest someone that's not new to 3D. They've actually been a part of the church family for the last two years. Maybe you didn't know this, but we actually have three retired pastors that are a part of our church family. And you're gonna hear from one of them today. His name is Joel Hahn. He and his wife, Annette, have been married for nearly 47 years. They're natives of Colorado. They've ministered throughout the Midwest over the last number of decades, but this is what they call home. They love this state. They love the mountains. In fact, Joel himself has already accomplished 31 14ers. And not only they love this state, they love the mountains, but the greatest love of their life is Jesus and his church and people. And you're about to be on the receiving end of that. So I want to encourage you right now to put your hands together and give great honor to our friend, Pastor Joel Hahn, as he comes to bring to you the message today. Wow, that's, that's special. I count it an honor to get to be here and uh, on, on the planet. <laughs> I, <laughs> the alternatives are, well, actually better, but uh, for now, you'll do. It's wonderful. Uh, Several things that are new to me since I retired from being a pastor for just about 40 years. And uh, that is, I can sit in the back row. And and that's really been a delight. Annette and I often find ourselves in the back row here. Uh, We have weekends now. There was no such thing as weekends uh, for 40 years, or let alone three or four day weekends. And... uh, And then, of course, uh, it's just, uh, well, I don't know. There's so many differences and changes. I count it an honor to get to be here as part of this church and get to talk to you today. So uh, thanks for showing up. Um, We'd like to also, uh, um, again, I'm a Denver native. And uh, when I was uh, about 1968, I... uh, could not drive yet, so I took a bus from my home in Park Hill and uh, took the bus downtown, and I don't remember if I was meeting some chick that I'd met at camp or something down there to go to a movie, I don't remember why, but I remember something profound that has uh, uh, affected my life forever, and that is, uh, I rode this bus, and as I was riding back, the bus stopped at a bus stop and seemed to be there for a very long time. And I looked out my window and I saw several uh, Vietnam soldiers in their, in their fatigues and, and they were kind of gathered around that bus stop. And I looked at them and I saw one of them's whole face was pockmarked from shrapnel. And another only had a leg down to here. And they were kind of, you know, there were other injured men there and they, they were chumming around together as they stood there and again, I was just before I was old enough to drive, and I remember um, crying because it finally occurred to me what people are willing to give for the benefit of others. And so if you're a veteran, as trite as it has become to say, thank you for your service, I mean it. Thank you. I thank you. I'd like to pray before we begin the sermon here. Heavenly Father, uh, I pray that this would be your time for your word, your stories, and for your Holy Spirit to work the work in us that you want to do today. Certainly pray that the team in South Africa will will, uh, prosper your kingdom this day, but that we too here will grow into the image of our Savior. And so by your power and your anointing, we seek this for Jesus' sake. Amen. 
I'm going to tell you stories, a few stories, but I'm going to tell you biblical stories. So if you have your Bibles, and I know that's hard to ask of folks anymore because we usually put them up on screens, and I didn't put this on the screen for you, so you're going to have to listen to me as a storyteller. Um, we're going into the Old Testament, and it's in, it starts, the story I'm going to tell you really starts in 1 Kings chapter 19. And if you're not familiar with the history of the Israelite people and all, Elijah is like a, an Old Testament hero. I mean, he's one of the major heroes. In fact, if you've come to a Passover supper, you know there's an extra chair sat that is sat at the table for Elijah. And, and if you read the stories, some people ask Jesus if John the Baptist was Elijah having come again. Elijah is a major character and a powerful prophet of God. But Elijah, after having this tremendous encounter with the prophets of Baal in the, in the ever more paganized society of northern Israel and, and the southern part, Judea, he, uh, Judah, he, he, uh, he had this enormous victory. And it's a, it's a great story, but that's not the story for today. And, and as that story wound down, you found out that, that this event apparently was like the last straw. It was the last that he could bear and carry under the leadership and power of God. Because when he finished, he fled after a victory. And he fled into the wilderness, and he hid there, and he whined, and he got depressed. He really had a rough go. And as far as I, I see it in terms of my own humanity, reading the story, he hit that point where he was spent. He was just spent. And God ministered to him as he was out in this wilderness and as he was trying to find, you know, just trying to recover. And, and as he was saying, I'm the only one that's faithful. And finally God says to him, you know, I've got at least 7,000 that I've held back that have not knelt their knee to Baal. You are not the only one. And so the story picks up in chapter 19 and Elijah comes out of that wilderness, out of that season of being totally spent and he, he comes and he finds a man in the field who apparently is a wealthy man, but a man who's up to his knees in dirt because he's plowing. And it says in the scriptures he's plowing behind 12 oxen. And he was the last pair. So I think he's wealthy enough that he had like six pairs, of, you know, six teams of folks plowing. And it just says he just sees Elisha don't get confused. Elijah, Elisha. I'll try to keep them straight. Elisha is plowing, and Elijah comes over, and he takes this long-haired cloak that, a, that most of the prophets would wear. He took it off his shoulders, and he threw it onto Elisha's shoulders. It's like, I'm spent. Here, your turn. Elisha doesn't expect it, but Elisha says, whoa, he says, don't go away, don't leave, don't leave. I got to take care of something before I come and follow you. So he, he, he got left the field, he sacrificed a couple of the head of, uh, of cattle that he was using, he uh, offered worship to God and thanks, and he said goodbye to his family, and he walked away from the, everything that he knew to be with Elijah. And for the next seven to 11 years, he just follows Elijah around. Now, I come from a generation. Well, Eric Burton and the Animals had a song, It's My Life and I'll Do What I Want. Anybody ever hear that? Anybody ever have kids say that? Anybody ever say that? I'll think as I please. I'll do as I want. It's my life. You got nothing you got can tell me what to do. But, you know, we know better. We know that we're saved by grace, right? But we know that our lives are no longer our own. One passage says we've been bought with a price. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. It's not our lives anymore. Our lives are Christ's. 
And what happens to us is, you know, I've been sitting here and I listen and I listen to these sermons and, and I love them. That, and it's about grace and it's about grace and it's about grace. And almost every time I hear preachers preach about grace, they then say, and then that takes us up to where we want to live for. We are so indebted and so grateful for the grace we've received that now we are indebted to serve. And we want to serve. And, and if we love, we want to serve. I don't, I don't serve my wife of 47, nearly 47 years because I have to. I do because I want to. Because I love her. And I know that she's got to love me a lot for all the service she gives me. And so that's where we are. It's not our lives. It's, it's that we're going to live for Christ. And yet a lot of us find ourselves kind of like we move to that, and then we go, thank you for the grace, but now I feel all encumbered and messed up that I can't seem to move forward and do the outward focus and be the outward focused human being that I'm trying to be. And that's where I just want to take you. I'm going to take you to Elisha now. And, and Elisha and Elijah's last day. It's going to go toward the end of, the, of, of this journey of, of, of uh, discipleship, really. And Elisha and Elijah, Elijah says to Elisha, he says, uh, God wants me to go down to Gilgal. So they pack up together, and they go together as a team down to Gilgal. I don't know what they did there, but they did whatever. And then all of a sudden, Elisha, Elijah says to Elisha, I, now, we need, now I, I've been called to go to Bethel. And he says, you just stay here. And Elisha says, no, I'm not staying here. That, I'm not doing that. As long as I live and as long as you live, I'm hanging with you. And so they travel together uh, from, from Gilgal to Bethel. And at Bethel, there are some, uh, there's a pod of prophets. And the prophets come over to Elisha. And they go, hey, Elisha, do you know that your master's life is going to be taken today? And I just love you. Elisha says, shh, I don't want to hear it. I know it, but I don't want to hear it, so I just, shh. Nobody needs to hear you talk like that. Well, then Elijah comes to Elisha, and he says, well, now God wants me to go to Jericho. So you just stay here. And Elisha says, no. Get your act together. I'm, I'm staying with you. As long as you're alive, I'm there. Okay. They go down there, and another pod of prophets is there. And they come to Elisha, and they say, Hey, did you know that your master is going to be taken from you today? Shh! I'm not listening to you. I know this already. I'm not putting up with this foolishness. Be quiet. Elijah comes back now to Elisha, and he says, nah, God wants me to go down to the Jordan. Or did I skip? Did I skip Jericho? Well, that's good. I, I'm old. I got I, I, my old my long term memory is really good because I remember going down to Jericho. Uh, but <laughs> from Jericho, he says I've got to go to the Jordan, and he and he says you just stay here. And Elisha says no way. And it says that they they traveled together down to the Jordan River, and that there is a pod of prophets and sons of the prophets. 50 men strong nearby, and they followed them down, and they stood a little over off at a distance, kind of to watch what was going on. Because after all, they all, everybody seemed to know that this was Elijah's last day. Elijah and Elisha go over there, and they, the river is flowing, and uh, Elijah takes his coat off, rolls it, folds it all up really nice, goes to the water, and goes, whack! And the water separates. And they walk across on dry ground to the other side. The two of them. Fifty prophets watching. They get to the other side. And uh, now it's time for Elijah and Elisha to have their own little time together. And uh, he, he, uh, let's see. The first thing, it's, uh, oh, I'm forgetting what the first thing he asked, but Elijah and Elisha, as they're talking, Elijah asks Elisha, what can I do for you? And Elisha says, you know what? I'd like to have double your spirit. 
And Elijah says, ah, that's kind of a hard thing <laughs> for me to give you. But uh, if you see me when I'm taken away, it shall be yours. Now, I want to stop the story there for a moment. And I just want to talk to you about, uh, I've got four steps. They're, they're simple. They're four steps to get off of this point and to move forward, Okay. So, so that we're not just living in gratitude for the grace, but that we are also energized and able to move forward. So the first thing I want to, first thing I want to tell you is you need to own your mantle. Remember that mantle was a symbol of God's anointing. It was a symbol of God's presence, a symbol of God's power. The prophet wore it. By the way, kings wore mantles, but they were all decorated. Priests wore deck. Decorated, well-decorated mantles as well. It's kind of like a cloak attached around the neck and it just kind of came down as out, outer garment. Uh, but the prophet wore usually a long-haired animal hide. It's kind of just grosser and simpler and more, I don't know, what do you say, just humble. Nothing showy. Well, I'm telling you that we, each one of us, have received a mantle. Every one of us. As long as you're still sucking air, Christ has called you to love God and to love your neighbor. That's our mantle. Every one of us. It's not, it's not just the preachers that get a mantle. All of us have a mantle. And it's really very simple. One of the, there are questions that people ask or st statements they make that drive preachers crazy. One of the ones that used to drive me crazy is, I'm just trying to find God's will for my life. And I'm thinking, you think he hid it? You have to find it? It's not hard to find. You wake up in the morning and you say, God, have me in your will. And you'll be there. Seriously. You will be there. You may, not be, you may be a total doofus, and you don't know why you're there, but you're there. Never second-guess a day that you ask God to lead you. Never second-guess how that day did. No matter how it turns out, doesn't matter. If you ask, he's, he's, he's not a jokester. If you ask, seek to do God's will, you'll be doing it. And your mantle is God's will for you. And every one of us has that mantle to love God and to love our neighbor. That's, that's the heart of God. That's the presence of God because God is love. The, it, 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 it is all it is. And so, you know, when you wear that mantle, it, it's not that you have to be shy about it or we have to be uh, somehow or other reserved or embarrassed by it. It is God's calling on your life. You are called by God to love. I don't know if you think about that, but that's a command that we are called to do. That's our mantle. Put it on your shoulders and wear it everywhere you go. It's God's calling. It's his anointing. It says, this is what I have in mind for you and for your life. I don't care if you're a plumber or a preacher. Just, you just do this. Love God and love those people that are around you. And that's your authority. It doesn't need anybody else's approval. It doesn't need anybody else's second. It's our mantle. That's the first step is to own it. Own it. Get up in the morning and say, this is what I'm going to do today. I'm going to love. I'm going to love my grandchildren. I'm going to love my children. I'm going to love my parents. I'm going to love the, my neighbors. I'm going, to, I'm, going to just, I'm going to be a person who loves. When I, was, uh, when I went off to college, I was in love with Annette. See, we're childhood sweethearts. We grew up in the same church here in Denver. And uh, I loved her a lot, but she was a year behind me in school. So she was still in high school here, Cherry Creek High School. And I was down at Byler University in Texas. And I wrote her every day. And I put a number on the back of the envelope how many days till I'd see her again. And I called her every day until I got the first bill. <laughs> you don't know about long distance, do you? In the grand old year of 1970, my first phone bill was $90. That's like $900 now. Okay. So I didn't call her any much after that. Because I wanted to have tuition money for next year. 
But anyway, um, I loved her. And, and you know what? Um, I was doing some Bible studies, and, I, and it said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I, and I thought, I have passion for Annette. I want to see her. I want to hold her. I want to make her happy. I want to be around her. I want to do things with her. I want anything in the world I would want to do for her. And I thought, well, I believe in God. I trust God. I'm saved by God. But I don't have a passion like that for God. And I learned by love, being in a love relationship with Annette that you could love God like that too. Well, anyway, take on that mantle and say, this is mine. This is my mantle. Every day, I got that mantle. The second thing I want to say is hang with your mentor. You know, I love Elisha. Elijah says, hey, just stay here. No, I'm not going to stay here. You are my mentor. I'm learning from you. I watch you. I'm modeling you. I'm trying to take everything you've got for me. And I'd say, I'd say we, you know, we all have, uh, by the way, Elisha is one of my mentors. I love the stories of Elisha. I love it when the kids call him Baldy. And so he says, take that. He's, a couple of female bears come out and maul 40 of them. You don't call Elisha baldy. I thought baldness was in my future, but it, I, I'm glad it wasn't. But anyway, we should hang with our mentor. We should just hang with him. And Jesus is my mentor, and God's word is a mentor to me. And, and, and if we can hang there and learn all that we could possibly learn. I have a cartoon for you. I have a few cartoons for you. There we go, the little kid. See, says to the teacher, could you not teach too much today? I'm running low on available memory. And I feel like some of us have real low capacities to take in what God is really putting out there for us to learn. And intentionality, to be focused, to say, I need to be growing. I need to get more. We need to hang with our mentor. So that's the two things, right? Own your mantle. Hang with your mentor. The third thing, and I've already told it in the story, is desire more and more of the Spirit. Now you heard that last Sunday in the sermon. But, you know, I think there's two things. First, you know, there's, we need to hang, I mean, we, we need to desire the spiritual gifts because we need them. But we also need to be around people who have spirit. How many of you have been to a place where you saw preachers and stuff in their dark suits? By the way, I started out with three-piece dark suits. You know, dark suit for weddings and funerals and other sad occasions. how that goes okay so but I've seen these ones and they sit like this and they just frowny faced you know the jowls hang all the way down and and they it's just like they're looking ready like they're ready to pounce on you about something well I don't want that spirit I like the spirit of an encourager like Pastor Keith somebody who sees the good and sees the potential and speaks it and brings it out for you well all right, here's, here you go, another cartoon. See a little kid? And he goes, and, he goes, and he's, his eyes are bulging, and he's screaming, and he's gotten. Finally, his dad says, anything? And he says, no, my superpowers haven't grown in yet. And I think a lot of us have that problem because we don't seek the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us, to get us off center, and to send us out there. One of the other things that drives people pastor's crazy, is, well, I don't have any spiritual gifts. I got nothing to offer. And then if you're really lowly, but you want to sound spiritual, you say, I don't have any spiritual gifts except I got the gift of hospitality. That's all you get if, that's all, if you're nothing. And I have found that people with the gift of service and hospitality to be the most fantastic people on the planet. I really can use them. I mean, I like them. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I do treasure them because there's a precious beauty to that humility. It's just, it's, it's, I think I skipped this cartoon, didn't I? I have another cartoon. Can you back up to the other one? I like this. This is how you feel when you're going to start something, right? You misspelled lemonade. The dog's got a lemonade stand. And I love his response. I'm a dog. Give me a break. <laughs> Can you see the misspelling error? The spelling error? 
Okay. <laughs> Most of us feel like we're kind of a doofus and, and you know, what are we going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to contribute? And, uh, but God says, I, I've equipped every single one of you. Every one of you is fully equipped for all the godliness that I expect of you. Everything pertaining to godliness has been granted to us. And so we can move off center. Okay, now, uh, I'm going to tell the rest a little more of this story. A little more of this story. The chariots of, and the, of flame and the horses of flame come down from heaven. A whirlwind and, and it swirls around and it separates Elijah and Elisha from one another. Remember, 50 prophets watching. It separates them and all of a sudden it takes Elijah up and he is no more. And Elisha's looking around and he's going, oh, now it's my turn. Now it's my turn. Ruh-roh. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Do you remember when, it's, when you were finally left and it was your turn? And maybe you're still standing over on that side of the Jordan going, wish it wasn't my turn. The fourth thing, fourth step, is you have to take the mantle, wad it up, and you've got to strike the water. You've got to do it. Somewhere along the line, you have to say, I'm going to do it. I was shown it worked. But it doesn't matter. If Elijah did it, can you do it? You get it? You get the dilemma this guy's in? This is so human. Elisha's been following Elijah around for quite a while. He has seen some pretty amazing things. He just walked through the Jordan River on dry ground. But Elijah's gone. All he's got is an audience of 50 pious prophets, a mantle, and a flowing river. And it says he bent down. And this is really what it says. It says he bent down, wadded up the mantle, and said... Oh, if there's a God in Israel. <laughs> Don't you think that's cool? I mean, seriously. If, only, if there's only a God, oh, please, God. I'm going to do exactly what I was just taught. But if it doesn't work, I'm going to be the biggest fool ever. Right? And this is what's true about all action. All action is adventure. Because you don't know how the action is going to turn out. That's up to God. A number of years ago, I decided to do what Jesus did. Instead of wonder what he would do, I decided that we would just do what he did. So I was living in western Kansas, and I decided I got tired of the wind. <laughs> and I went outside, and I went to the corner where the little intersection was out in the open country, where the dirt was about to shave my ankles right off my legs. <laughs> and I turned into that wind, and I went, Peace be still! Didn't work. <laughs> I think you already knew that, didn't you? You thought, who is this fool? I have been, I have tried to walk on unfrozen water. One step is all I've ever gotten. I tried then running on it and got about a step and a half. I was on a 14er. I was climbing uh, Mount Antero one time, and uh, from behind the mountain, we didn't see it coming, a little lightning storm came. The lightning was hitting, and I was probably 200 vertical feet from the summit, long ways away from shelter. I was on the ridge, and I looked up there, and I said, oh, God, would you send that storm over there to that mountain? And it went over the other mountain. I must have had faith that day. I don't know. People asked me when 
why don't you touch people more when you're pastoring and stuff? That would sure mean so much more to them. And I'd go, well, I don't know. You start doing stuff like that. You, next thing you know, you have expectations. You're like, you pray for healing, and then people are going to think, well, how come I wasn't healed? You know, I, you, you get it. But that's, that's, the, that's the part of the privilege of the mantle. If God puts it on your heart to pray for somebody, you pray for them. And if you, if you pray for healing, that's great. Pray for healing if that's the desire of your heart. Pray always for God's will above and above everything else so that you're just like Jesus. I'd like this cup to pass from me, but I'd really like your will. I'll do your will. I'm not settling for it. I prefer your will, but I have lots of other brothers. So you pick up the mantle and you say, okay, I have somebody here I need to love. I need something I need to do over here. Be bold enough to say, this is now adventure. I've now, I'm now living an adventure. And yes, there are spectators. You never know what a spectator is going to give you. So you do the mantle anyway. You just ask God to please show up. And you strike the water. Action, when God is behind it, wants us to do more than we can do on our own. But if we don't strike the water, we don't know it'll do it. Is that right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you two funny stories. One, one that terrorized. When I was pastoring in Sterling, Illinois, I was only 30 miles from where Keith was pastoring, and I didn't even, never met him. His, uh, the theme, uh, never mind. Um, their, their high school mascot was pretzels. Were you there too? Oh. My daughter had a hard time not laughing when she was a cheerleader for the Sterling. When they were saying, you know, break the pretzels or whatever it was that you. <laughs> it, it was so ferocious. It was. But anyway, um, I had a Bible study of a group of pastors in Sterling and. And I, I told them one, about one of my hospital visits once because I, I really wanted to be able to do things like Elisha and the other bold people of God would do. So I, I, I told them about a hospital visit I had done to a fellow who, who was passing away. He had had major heart surgery. He had, you know, all the tubes and whistles, you know, everything you have. And I knew this was the last time I was going to see him. So and his name was Bill, and I, I, I went to his hospital. I went to the ICU, and I climbed up on his bed and I laid on top of him. And I put my hands under his shoulders and, you know, braced, took a little of my weight off of him so that I wasn't the cause of his death. <laughs> and I put my face next to his face and I prayed for him. And I told him that, uh, I said, Bill, you are my brother forever. I will see you again later. Prayed for him and left and buried him a couple days later. And after I told that story to these pastors, one of them said, hey guys, if I'm ever in that state, don't tell Joel. <laughs> <laughs> That's just for fun. Here's the story about that, a mantle that was thrown on my shoulders uh, last summer. Last summer, uh, we had our grandson, one of our, one of our grandsons from Michigan, fly out here. And he flew as an unaccompanied minor. And as an unaccompanied minor, you have to get there early. You have to, you know, you get someone who goes to the gate with you. And, and the, the person at the gate with you has to stay till the plane leaves. And, I mean, there's, there's just a lot of little rules and things that are involved with it. Well, when I took him to the airport to take him back, Annette needed to sleep because uh, it was a really seven o'clock flight, I think, and now, you know, why, why send two people to suffer when only one is, would do? So I went to the airport, and I took Joe Ash, who's his name, and, and, and we were there early, got registered in and everything, and we're waiting, and they finally start to board. It's, the unaccompanied minors are the first ones boarding, and I didn't know it, but another woman was there with a 14-year-old. He was 13, my son, grandson, and and they, were, they went on down, and, and the, you know, that, that long tunnel swallowed them up, and the airplane took them onto it. 
Then other people were going in. But I noticed, because I have to, you have to stay until the plane leaves if you are there for that unaccompanied minor. Well, we were there, and I saw this woman, and I said, oh, this is another kid going. And he was swallowed up by the tra- plane, and so was my grandson. And then she went off to the side over to the glass where you could see the plane and just started weeping and weeping and weeping. And, and I saw her. I had gone back and sat down, and I saw her, and I saw her, and I saw her, and God threw a mantle on my shoulders. So I did what all of us would do. I got up and I went to the restroom. <laughs> and stayed in there as long as I could. <laughs> when I came out, even though there were hundreds of people still around, she was still at that glass weeping. So I took on a little ownership of that mantle. And I walked over to her. She's maybe 40. I'm ancient. And this is the Me Too, dirty old men time of life here going on. I went over to her and I said, looks like you're really having a hard time. And she's going like this. And I said, do you need a hug? And she said, yes. So I took her in my arms and she took me in hers. And I whispered in her ear as I gave her an embrace. I said, just take the strength of the Lord from me. I have plenty to share. And then we let go of each other. And we visited for the 25 to 30 more minutes. She was heartbroken. This was her son. She did not have custody of her son. But at the age of 14, he could decide who he was going to be with. He was getting on that plane to go back to be with his dad. And she said, I had so hoped that I'd see him coming back out of that tunnel to choose me. And she says, I was afraid for him. And she told me the travails of her marriage and of her, of her ex's drug dealing and other things. She just told this long story. And we stayed together this far apart until the plane started rolling. I told her, I reminded her, you know, the God who was good yesterday is the same God who is good today. And he will care for you and your kid. Plane starts to move away. I said, do you need another hug? And she said, yes. And I gave her another hug. And we went our separate ways. God threw that mantle on my shoulders. All I had to do was take ownership of it and then do the love that he has for us to do. That's our call. To be the people in this world that show who God is to the people around us. Heavenly Father, give us the courage to walk the kind of journey that accepts the mantle every time you throw it on us, to even perceive it, to be ready and eager to give the heart away that you've given to us. And I pray that we'll do that for your honor and glory and for the benefit of of those who heretofore have not gotten to know your love. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.